Welcome to our next panel, which is on the consequences of systemic racism in science and steps toward a better future. Uh, we have had two days out of amazing uh, conversations on a range of issues, many of which touch the issue of systemic race and racism and its impact on STEM. Um, I am a, a co-moderator along with Shirley Malcolm and she will be joining us shortly. Uh, so I will have the pleasure of introducing uh, all of our amazing panelists today. Um, so um, we have four panelists uh, today with us. Uh, our first panelist is Joe DeSimone. He is professor in the departments of radiology and chemical and engineering and graduate school of business at Stanford University. I'll be talking about uh, the loss, uh, the impacts of systemic racism on science and innovation. Uh, then we will be, we will hear from Tashaka Cunningham, who's the chief science officer for True Genomics. And he will discuss the consequences of racism in science for public in, uh, for public trust in science, a topic that has been touched upon uh, for, uh, I've heard this raised a number of times over the last two days. Uh, our third speaker is Amani Allen. She's executive associate dean at UC Berkeley School of Public Health. And she will be addressing um, public health issues through the lens of racism. And then in closing, uh, we will have Anne Giros gates uh, She's the Vice Provost for Faculty Affairs at the University of Texas at El Paso. Uh, and she will discuss the changing the narrative and supporting culture change. Um, I'd like to um, hope all of you can see uh, the faces of our uh, wonderful panelists. Uh, and I thank you all for being here and for our audience as well. And I will now turn uh, the, uh, the session over to our first speaker, uh, Dr. DeSimone. Great, thank you. Let me uh, share my slides. Well, thank you. It's, uh, <clears throat> it, it's I'm honored to participate in this uh, important uh, discussion. And, uh, you know, the, the reflection about, you know, what we lose when we don't get um, diversity, equity, inclusion uh, correct is really profound. And I want to put it in a context of convergence, which is something that a lot of people, no one, very few people dispute the impact that convergence has is driving innovation. And, you know, this whole, a lot of this was, was triggered out of MIT and a while back and and Susan Hockfield and, and Phil Sharp and Bob Langer and team. And you talk about the convergence of life sciences, physical sciences and engineering, <clears throat> really driving innovation. And the National Academies has been uh, a big uh, proponent for this as well. And you know, the whole premise is that different fields of study come together and new thinking emerges. And a lot of this is grounded in statistics and other things. And in fact, it goes well beyond the life sciences, physical sciences, and engineering, and arguably is extended to the social sciences, humanities, and even the performing arts. And, and the belief that convergence is a blueprint for innovation is, uh, is, is a tried and true sort of perspective um, in, in a lot of circles. And <clears throat> you know, we made the point a number of years ago, uh, six years ago, in fact, uh, a little more than six years ago, about you know this interplay between convergence and and diversity and my co-author here Christopher Farrell and I talked about the you know the similarities about this you know we have students in a lab that grow up with not much money they think about problem solving differently than somebody who grew up with a lot of money and that these different perspectives bring a lot of value to the innovation uh, community or the or innovation to the community and this whole idea even disciplinary diversity. Is, is well thought of, but you know this idea that we learn the most from those that we have the least in common with, and that that's really the key foundation for driving uh, innovation and 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 the importance of that. And and the and the whole point is, if we're not intentional about our groups, uh, we risk the negative impact on the innovation uh, uh, process itself fundamentally. And you know, I think for me, this is uh, was well described in, in Scott Page's book. Uh, that you know diversity is a fundamental tenet of innovation and you know this whole premise that um, you know that in you know, diversity is a powerful component of, uh, of, of problem solving 
you know, it, and it don't, it doesn't always trump ability, but it does, it does so far more often than we'd expect is, is an observation, you know, driven by data that people uh, realize. But often, you know, what you'll see is when people have this conversation about diversity uh, on teams, that inevitably it pops up in all sorts of circles, you know, does this imply that we should abandon the meritocracy? And I think the point is absolutely not. Ability matters, but so does diversity. They're different, they're, they're different points, they're different perspectives. And, uh, and uh, you know, the two sides of the same coin of, in, of innovation, it's something that we really, uh, we've got to get right going forward. And, you know, for me, <clears throat> this whole, um, premise that, uh, you know, there's no more fertile ground for innovation than a diversity of experience and how that diversity of experience arises from a difference of cultures, ethnicities, and life backgrounds. A successful scientific endeavor is one that attracts a diversity of experience, draws upon the breadth and depth of that experience, cultivates those differences, and acknowledging the creativity that they spark. And uh, this is something that uh, <clears throat> my group has been uh, driving forward and uh, forward and, and Shirley uh, adopted uh, this quote from us about uh, in some of her congressional testimony, which we really appreciated. But you know, where this came to for us is a couple of impactful moments in my career. Uh, you know, very quickly, I was part of an innovation group early in my career and, and, um, and I flew in uh, to this uh, group and not only was it a group of all white men around the table, which I'm often walking into those kinds of rooms. And it wasn't this photo, this is just a dramatic one. Um, but not only is it all white men, but they all graduated from the same two research groups. They all knew the same stuff. And me as an outsider, I had a, as a white man, I had a difficult time breaking into this conversation. And it dawned on me that this group was at a structural disadvantage uh, to drive innovation. Further, um, my group and I in particular was supposed to be a keynote speaker for a, a conference back in 2010 uh, or sorry, 2000, about 20 years ago, uh, related to uh, my discipline of fluoropolymers. And uh, I was the keynote lecturer, my group being a very diverse group. Uh, the, the meeting was to be held in South Carolina. And it was at a time when the Confederate flag was above the Capitol. And I brought the point up to my group because the NAACP was boycotting it uh, because of this. And uh, we decided as a group that we weren't gonna go. We're gonna honor the boycott. And we wrote a letter very quietly to the ACS said we weren't going. They came back and said, wait a minute, hold off. And a week later, they called us and said, we're moving the meeting. And um, again, we weren't promulgating that we were doing this, but the CNE News, the chemistry uh, 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 magazine wrote, wrote this up. And I realized at this point that when you're clear about your values, that your, your group can become a destination for excellence. And that's why I think it's really important that we talk about these topics and, and, uh, and move these forward. And you know, to me, those are the kinds of things that uh, are really important. If we're really gonna be driving innovation, we've gotta get diversity, equity, and inclusion correct. And we've got to speak about our values so that we can be uh, thought of as, as destinations for excellence. With that, let me pause and, and we can proceed with the next speaker, I think. Thanks, Joe. And I'm back. Uh, I got lost somewhere in the, uh, the ethosphere. Uh, I am, uh, and I want to thank you for moving ahead. Uh, I'm not sure that you had a proper introduction, but we are pleased to uh, be able to uh, to welcome you here. Um, our next speaker is uh, Dr. Tashaka Cunningham, uh, who is co-founder and chief scientific officer of Chugen Chug Genomics, uh, an, engage an emerging precision genomics biotech company that is harnessing the power of genomics to improve risk prediction and diagnosis of PTSD. Before, he, before entering the private sector, uh, Tashaka held several key positions in the Department of Veterans Affairs, including those that involved engagement with minority veterans and HBCUs to help increase the diversity of institutions and researchers supported by the agency. Uh, he values work in the community 
and previously served as the Director of Scientific Collaboration for the Drug Information Association and is currently the Executive Director of the Faith-Based Gen Genetic Research Institute, an organization whose mission is to democratize access to genomic research and precision medicine for historically underrepresented minority communities. Shaka. Well, thank you, Dr. Malcolm. So great to be with you. I'm glad to be a part of this uh, discussion, very important discussion. Um, on the, you know, the impact and the consequences of racism on science and public trust. Um, this is something that is very personal to me. I'm a person of color, African-American, uh, born and raised here in the DC area, um, and have lived the experience of becoming um, a scientist of color and really understanding the issue of um, the lack of diversity in science and some of the consequences of that lack of diversity, including the lack of trust that it caused in science and medicine uh, that have had really, really deleterious and, and negative impacts on all communities uh, that medicine and science is trying to better serve. So I'm looking forward to having this uh, dialogue. I, I'll share a few slides and kind of level set um, my portion of the discussion around what are some of the root causes of this uh, and, and how might we think about moving forward? Because again, as a scientist, I always like to start with the problem and you, you know, come up with a hypothesis of, and then you, and you do your experiments and then, um, and then you find a solution. So I'm really, really focusing on the solutions as we move forward and having these dialogues that will further lay out what the problems are. So let me just uh, share my screen um, with, with slides and uh, talk through these a little bit. Okay. Make sure everybody can see that. Okay, I think from the previous sec, uh, session, you guys met this wonderful gentleman, <laughs> Dr. Uh, Samuel Cartwright. Um, and I, re I really think it's important for us to, to understand when we're talking about racism and the consequences of it, where it started. And you know, racism has been a part of the fabric of this country, unfortunately, from its very beginning. And from the very beginning, the US has led the way in this science of racial discrimination and it's actually a pseudoscience by but with folks like uh, Dr. Cartwright here who I mean looking at this picture even 200 years later you can kind of see the racism seething out of his pores here um, was was a doctor he was actually a doctor at the University of Pennsylvania and wrote a, a very interesting document called the report on diseases and physical peculiarities of the Negro race where he laid out a treatise on different diseases specific uh, to African Americans, and one of you know, my favorites from that uh, in incredibly uh, uh, disturbing report was drapetomania, right? Which was a condition that he came up with that was the the consequence of an, an enslaved African uh, person wanting to gain his freedom. It was actually a mental condition that said that that enslaved African would want to run away. Uh, and, and so, when you think about that, how science was in this case weaponized. To, to, uh, to disturb the populace in a way that kept a group down. It's been around from the beginning. And this concept of racial and genetic inferiority was accepted science in, in, in the United States from, from the earliest parts of its beginning. Uh, and it spawned movements like eugenics and phrenology and these pseudoscience that further reinforce negative stereotypes about certain racial ethnic groups. Um, and it's stunning to me, most of us don't know uh, in the scientific community how pervasive this was throughout the, the country. There are actually eugenics laws on the books in, in, in states, southern states like Mississippi up until the late 1960s. And some of these laws required sterilization of certain individuals that were regarded as dim-witted um, that were from these different groups. And I, you know, I could give you a whole lecture on eugenics, but I think it's really important for us to just understand how far back this goes and how pervasive that seed of, of racism, initial racism was at the beginning. And it's not just this, it's other things. It's actually a series of psychological scars, I say, on communities of color, particularly African-Americans that have been uh, handed to them at the hands of established uh, doctors and scientists over the years. And so exhibit A, again, uh, on this would be the Tuskegee syphilis study. And this is a classic um, uh, story in medical ethics or the lack thereof, 
a government sponsored study that went on from 1932 until 1972 um, that really where African Americans in rural Alabama were recruited to uh, participate in a study on, on syphilis and they were purposely injected with syphilis uh, and when they were being told they were given a, a treatment for it. So when you think about the distrust that that creates in the community, my grandmother, who was a researcher herself at uh, the National Cancer Institute before she passed, knows some of the children that were born to uh, uh, the, the families of these Tuskegee survivors who were born blind because they were purposely injected with syphilis. So you can imagine that lack of trust, that sense of lack of trust that the medical establishment instilled. Then you have Henrietta Lacks, and that's a common story that we know now, again, because it's been publicized in the press um, with, uh, with uh, Oprah making a movie about it. There's a book out there about it, but the fact that this uh, African-American woman, Henrietta Lacks, her cells were literally taken from her without her position, permission and used to make countless scientific discoveries that led to billions of dollars uh, in pharmaceutical and biotech industry, uh, yet her family really saw very little of it. And then the, the final uh, exhibit C, I'll call it, is just the countless instances of health disparities that are experienced by African-American patients all, all over the place throughout the years. So you have all of this, these experiences that have been largely negative, that have led to and reinforced some of the disparities we see, not only in participation of Blacks, uh, blacks and uh, other minorities in science, uh, but also clinical trials. And we've probably talked about that quite a bit, but this it, it, it's, a, it's a cumulative set of psychological scars that have been um, established in this community. And it's been very aggressive over the years. Um, and that's something that we really need to consider. So what do we do about it? How do we overcome the net result of that, which has been this lack of trust by communities of color with science and, and the medical community? Well, I think you know, there's some things we, we could start to do, and I hope through our panel, we'll talk about more of them but really highlighting the benefits that patients have seen due to advances in science and biomedical research. There have been a lot of great things that have happened out of this. Advances in conditions like sickle cell disease that do um, uh, preferentially affect uh, people of color, particularly people of African descent. Uh, we're on the verge of curing those with genetic therapy. So making more people aware of that. And then I would say, expanding access to really enable more minorities and people of color to become active participants in the business of science. We often talk about getting more people into the pipeline. That's great, but if we get people into the pipeline and then we can't get them up the chain so that they have higher level jobs, uh, then what are we really doing? How are we moving the needle and getting people in positions of, of power and authority where they can help change the system from the inside? And then really very importantly, we have to address racism at every level, particularly the highest level in academia, industry, and government to create a truly level playing field for scientists of color. We have to call it out. We have to acknowledge it. It's like first, you know, understanding that you have a problem and then begin to acknowledge it and address it. And I think, um, you know, I hope we have a very robust discussion on how to best address it. But I think as a community, scientists often overlook this uh, to its detriment. And, and lastly, we want to do that to ultimately produce more what I call honest brokers. People who are not unlike myself, I'm a person of color who's also a scientist. So when I go to other communities of color and talk about science, there's a certain level of credibility I have by being a part of the community. Having that honest broker that can be a trusted source of scientific information for African-Americans and other minorities will help science repair some of these wounds. So I think if we have that, that mindset, and it comes from a place of authentic uh, empathy, uh, I think we'll have a chance at really addressing this. And I'm really glad that we're having these discussions now and look forward to being part of the dialogue. I'll stop there. Thank you very much. That was great. Uh, we've had now two different kinds of perspectives. One is the notion of the importance of um, of uh, diversity and the importance of these different perspectives in terms of supporting innovation. The next, uh, talking about the need to build trust within the community. Uh, and now we're gonna be talking, uh, turning to uh, Dr. Allen, uh, as we talk about the larger issues related to uh, when racism meets public health. Um, Dr. Imani Allen is the Executive Associate Dean and Associate 
professor of community health sciences and epidemiology at the University of California, Berkeley School of Public Health, where her research focuses on race and socioeconomic health disparities and the measurement and study of racism as a social determinant of health. Dr. Allen is principal investigator of the African American Women's Health Heart and Health Study, which examines the association between um, racism stress, cardiometabolic uh, risk, and biological stress more generally among African American women in the uh, San Francisco Bay Area. She's also co principal investigator of the Bay Area Heart Health Study which examines similar associations among African-American men with an emphasis on coping and internalized racism. Uh, Dr. Allen, thank you for being with us. Thank you. Um, and I just wanna say thank you to AAAS for hosting this very important forum. Um, so I'm gonna be talking just for a few minutes on this issue of addressing public health issues through the lens of racism. And what I'd like to do is start by sharing several common definitions of race from various disciplines. And what I'd like to point out here as you read through these definitions is that they're all biological in nature. And these definitions are a bit dated. They're from the 80s, from the 1980s or so. If we come more recently to the year 2000 and look at the definition of race from the Dictionary of Epidemiology, which by the way is a foundational discipline within the field of public health, we see that although there is an acknowledgement that social scientists have challenged the biological definition of race, it goes on to state, however, that race is a useful concept from the public health perspective because some diseases are strongly correlated with biological aspects of race and that useful insights into human biology and genetics derived from an analysis by racial groups. The most recent definition of race um, from the most recent edition of the Dictionary of Epidemiology is in 2014. And there are some helpful modifications here, such as the recognition that race is determined largely based on how others view us. However, it goes on to state that race is a category that's used in the classification, at least in biology, used in the classification of organisms or groups of individuals with a species that are geographically, ecologically, physiologically, or genetically distinct from, um, from other members of the species. And although it does go on to state that race often reflects social and ideological conventions, it also suggests that race may, again, similar to the 2000 definition, that race still is a useful concept in public health because some exposures and diseases are correlated with biological and phys physical aspects of race and that useful insights into human biology and genetics have come from analysis by racial group. And I also wanna point out um, the italicized part of this definition, the statement that socioeconomic, cultural and behavioral differences are more important than racial differences in influencing health status. And I'll come back to some of these um, comments or statements in a bit. Now in ta Coates' book, Between the World and Me, and previously in James Baldwin's book on be being white and other lies, they talk about uh, this, this idea of people who think they're white. They talk about people who think they're white. And by that, they're referring to the social construction of race. Something that's really a figment of our imagination, an illusion built upon prejudicial beliefs, which led to a system of social hierarchy that determined differences in life chances and opportunity structures between groups, including the opportunity to live a healthy and productive life. As Coates states, race is the child of racism, not the father. And naming groups has never been a matter of genealogy or physiognomy, but of hierarchy. Now this slide um, shows data from the Behavioral Risk Factor Surveillance Survey and shows reports of excellent or very good health at the bottom. And we'll just focus on the bottom bars um, in green for a moment by dyads of self-identified and socially assigned race. 
And so if you look at the dyads, on the left is self-identified race and on the right is socially assigned race. And we see the biggest jump in reports of excellent or very good health based on socially assigned race. So people going from being socially assigned Hispanic to socially assigned white. And then we see a more modest increase in going from self-identified Hispanic to self-identified white. But what we see here again is kind of health being determined largely based on how others view us. And I'm only showing you an example here of, of Hispanic or, or Latinx with white, but we see this same pattern across a number of other dyads. Now, when we look at population health and we look across numerous indicators of population health, and I'm only showing you a few examples here, we've seen that in the large part, population health has improved dramatically over time for all racial groups. Here we're looking at cardiovascular cardiovascular disease death rate, and here post-neonatal mortality rate um, from somewhat recent data. And what we're seeing again is that although population health is improving for all groups, that the health divide is persistent, and in some instances it's even widened. And this brings up this issue of the causes of population health not being the same as the causes of health disparities. And so I would argue that when we think about this kind of persistent health divide, that we have to start asking different questions. If we know, for example, that of everything that we've learned about how to improve population health over the last 50, 60, 70 years, which is a lot, that we have been able to move the needle very little in closing the racial divide in health, then we have to start asking ourselves different kinds of questions, not just what are the causes of population health, but what are the causes what are the causes of health despair of health disparities and i would go a step further and say health inequities and i would argue that one of the underlying factors that we have not paid enough attention to is racism and so what i'd like to do now is just position racism as a root or fundamental cause of health and argue that racism therefore is a risk regulator so going back to um, one of the statements from the earlier definition that stated let me find it um, it said something about, oh, it said socioeconomic, cultural, and behavioral differences are often more important than racial differences in influencing health status. And so what I'd like to suggest is that instead of pitting one social factor or social determinant against another social determinant, that we actually consider that when it comes to racial health inequity, so not just racial health disparities, because disparities just means difference, but racial health inequities, differences that are unfair and unjust and that are entirely preventable. That we consider the ways in which racism regulates our exposure to a variety of other health risks, social risks that determine racial health inequities. And so I offer that as food for thought as we um, turn to the next speaker. I think that what we have here <clears throat> is a is a buildup of information that indicates what happens when we don't have um, the when we don't pay attention to systemic racism in science, but we also want to look at how can we in fact uh, build toward a be better future. And um, I, we have asked Dr. Ann uh, Kiros Gates uh, if she can begin to help us move in that direction. Uh, Anne is the Vice Provost of the University of Texas at El Paso. She holds the AT&T Distinguished Professorship and served as Chair of the Computer Science Department uh, from 2005 to 2008 and then from 2012 to 2020. Uh, Anne is Associate VP for Research and Sponsored Projects. Um, Dr. Gates is the Executive Director of the Computing Alliance for Hispanic Serving Institutions one of the NSF's eight national includes alliances that promotes the in importance of inclusion and equity in advance of innovation and discovery. The importantly, UTEP, where Anne has spent her career, her career uh, as an HSI, as a Hispanic serving institution, is committed to the success of its students and its community. And Dr. Gates has been a major actor in making that happen, focusing on systemic approaches she has given serve a tremendous service to AAAS as well as a member of the board appointed committee on opportunities in science. 
Uh, Dr. Gates has received many awards in recognition of her work. Uh, the two, 2015 Great Minds in STEM Education Award, the uh, CRA's 2015 A. Nico Heberman Award, the Anita Borg Institute Social Impact Award, and the uh, 2009 Richard Tapia uh, Achievement Award for Scientific Scholarship, Civic Science, and Diversifying Computer Computing. Anne, uh, thank you for joining us. Well, thank you, Shirley. It's really a pleasure to be here. I appreciate the invitation. I would like to start by sharing a quote. Let's see if I can get this to work. Uh, by sharing a quote from Megan Smith, who was the chief technology officer under President Obama. She says, we as a nation must challenge every CEO, every company, and every investor to think about what they can do to ensure that they're tapping into all of our nation's talent so that there's workforce investment portfolios look like America. Her statement aligns with the message that comes from the National Academy's report, Minority Serving Institutions, America's underutilized resource for strengthening the STEM workforce. As has been said by other presenters, inclusion and diversity are critical for creating and building better products. There are roughly 700 MSIs that are established um, and that have an intentional focus on educating students of color. MSIs can serve as a national resource for STEM talent, although there are many that face challenges uh, to expand STEM opportunities. Uh, numerous tech companies are committed to end racism practices. I serve on a high tech diversity, equity, inclusion or DEI committee, which is led by a visionary champion. And the goal is to address the challenge that Megan Smith posed. How do we diversify our science and technology driven workforce? MSIs uh, can produce a future workforce. However, it's critical that industry and institutions of higher education, including PWIs undergo systemic transformation centered on DEI. In this slide, I present dimensions that should be considered at any institution of higher education or company organization that is invested in transformative change for inclusive and equitable environments. The points are informed by AAAS C change and the Excellencia of Education Seal of Excellence which employ a self-assessment approach that includes data collection, analysis, and reflection, and intentional actions outlined in a plan that address improvement. Data is collected to inform, check progress toward goals, understand climate, improve processes, structures, policies, and procedures. Leadership must be committed to DEI as demonstrated by the messaging, um, resource allocation, accountability for the culture, and success of minoritized individuals at all levels at the university, from the administration to the students. In a company, this would refer to the C-suite, the manager, and staff at all levels. The mission of the university must include a commitment to DEI. The representation across all levels of the organization should be diverse. The institutional and college units should have a culture that creates a sense of belonging and identity. And from the perspective of student support, an institution should have programs to support curricular success and provide opportunities for engagement and development. Financial support is critical for minoritized students, especially those that are first generation. There must be um, faculty, staff, professional development, uh, that supports pedagogical and inclusive practices, research and other engagement opportunities, and faculty and staff are hired with a commitment to DEI. An institution has an established uh, communication structures among, all, among leadership, faculty, staff, and students. There's equitable communication of opportunities centered on professional development and student success. It is also important that there is recognition and acknowledgement of the efforts that support DEI. This slide elucidates how leadership can change the culture of a university. 
As Shirley mentioned, uh, Dr. Diana Natalicio, the president of UTEP for a little over 30 years, set a vision around access and excellence. That is an institution that reflects the population of the region that it serves and grows the research enterprise. You can see that the demographics are, are of, our, of our university now reflects the region, which is a little over 80% Hispanic. Over half of our students are first gen. UTEP is recognized or was recognized as one of the top universities for social mobility, that is moving students from the lowest 25 percentage percentile of income to the highest 25 percentile of income. Last year, U UTEP was designated as a Carnegie R1 top tier doctoral university with very high research activity. And it was also, also received the seal of excellence. This year, UTEP also was recognized by the Carnegie Foundation's Community Engagement Classification that recognized scholarly partnerships with local, regional, and national community. UTEP is a model institution for serving Hispanics. In this last slide, um, I talk a little bit about um, our UTEP's institutional culture through a student lens. Each institution has its own culture and its own mission and how one will approach DEI. And so when you look at UTEP's um, mission, it's supported by a university-wide initiative called the EDGE, centered on student success, providing students a competitive advantage through high impact practices. The guiding principles of the EDGE initiative are integrated into UTEP's day-to-day -day operations and owned by everyone at the university at all levels. Students, uh, regardless of race, ethnicity, gender, intersectionality, must feel that the university is invested in their success. And that message comes from the top. Uh, a quick aside is that even the person at the key shop talks to students about the, the, their success through the EDGE initiative. There is a recognition that Hispanic culture and multilingual, multicultural competency contribute to the global success of all. Asset-based approaches are integrated uh, in efforts that serve students through research engagement, active teaching and learning, community engagement, and holistic advising and mentoring. And there is continuous learning, data analysis, and reflection that, is support, that support our ability to better serve our, our students. And I'll turn it over to you, Shirley. Thank you. If all of my panelists can join me here, I, I want to just start off and unmute. And I want to just start off with one kind of question. It, it, it's really cl been cl it's really clear from what you've all said that uh, science and technology are powerful tools, and that they have the possibility of being able to address a lot of the challenges that we actually have in our communities and it as individuals, but that they can, and that they can make our lives better, but they can also be used to basically inflict harm in the sense of shaping the way that people discuss, discuss issues and what have you. And I'd just like for you to reflect from your own comments, you know, on a, on a little bit of that. Anybody can start. Um, yeah, I'd, I'd love to uh, jump in on that because I think it's a great point. I look at science and to some extent it's parallel religion as the same kind of thing. Um, you, you can think of situations where these things can do great good, or in some cases, great harm. And um, I think in the case of science, particularly when you think about some of the pseudoscience of, of racism and eugenics and you know, some of the things we talked about, it was really weaponized to really uh, produce a situation where it oppressed a group of people and endangered their lives. And I think we're still recovering from that because it set, at least in this country, vis-a-vis -vis African Americans specifically uh, that came through slavery and, and some of the atrocities of that, um, you have these stereotypes that have persisted that need to be undressed and you know redone and completely debunked. And I think that has penetrated higher academia from its inception here. Um, and this idea of um, you know one group being smarter than or less than another has to be completely debunked. And um, even as recently as this last decade, you've had prominent scientists like James Watson 
talking about you know racial ethnic differences and genetics and that's just crazy so i think debunking that calling it out and as a community really addressing that is going to be important because science can be a force for good as it has been or it could be directed in a very nefarious way which in some cases it has been so we are the police on that as scientists we have to make sure that doesn't happen I'd like to jump in on that really quickly and, and emphasize the importance of having an asset base approach. Um, because what we do see at a lot of MSIs is that there's a de deficit thinking uh, around who our students are and that they need help. And, and while there may be some truth to, um, they may need um, other opportunities to really excel, we really believe that everyone is capable of excelling and that we focus on the students' assets. You know, these are your assets and this is what you can do to really elevate um, your, your knowledge in the field. And so taking an asset-based approach is really important. And then it's also the words that are used. I mean, there's, there's words that are used that are um, especially around women, Latinas, around their capabilities. And, and because the Alliance works a lot with the, we just had a session with Latinas, it's appalling to hear that there's still comments made by professors around um, a woman's ability to excel in computer science within, within a classroom when they're given a test. So um, really um, things that we have to pay attention to. And I think, uh, Joe? Did you want to jump in here? Yeah, I think building upon that, it's, it's not just the words, but it's it's the whole, every aspect of it. You know, walking down that long hallway to the president's office and seeing all the portraits of the white males. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I just imagine how daunting that gauntlet looks like. And I'm, I'm using a clear word there. I mean, it just feels awful. I mean, can imagine that or walking into a room you know, that's not representative and, and uh, you know, you're sitting in a classroom and, and the faculties in our departments are not reflective of the classroom uh, population. So it's not just the words. I mean, I think it's everything and uh, it can be stifling. And, you know, the analogy too is, is uh, you know, when you do K through 12 outreach in your centers and, you know, you want to be able to, you want to be able to reach young people about science and and uh, you know you've got to think about the imagery of you know who is who is who's presenting and who's who's engaging, so that people feel included, uh, feel welcomed, and not you know not being a, you know a minority in that community, right? I mean they're reflective of of uh, the general population, so that they can feel uh, included and welcomed. Thanks, Amani. Yeah, um, this is such a great conversation. Thank you for starting out with that question. I want to go back to what Tashaka started with because he mentioned religion. And so something that I've always heard in church is if you know better, you're expected to do better. And I would argue that that same mantra rings just as true in science as it does in, in religious communities and organizations. That as scientists, we do know better. Right. This is this is not the 1950s, the 1900s, the 1800s. We do know better. And so we we have a certain moral and ethical obligation to ourselves and to the communities that we represent to be held accountable, to be accountable to ourselves and to one another for asking the right questions. Um, the days of asking the questions about, is it genes that explains racial health disparities? Is it, it could be all of these other things, but we know better now. So we have to do better. We have to ask different kinds of questions. Um, we have, you know, I believe that as scientists, we are in a community that has the ability and holds a certain amount of power for knowledge generation and dissemination. And so we really can help set the agenda, create conversations, generate discussions about information. But if we're asking the wrong questions and those conversations will never take place. And when we think about um, when we think about that ability or that power we have of knowledge generation and dissemination, one of the things that um, I talk to my students about a lot is kind of how, you know, we're doing statistical analysis in our research, and but the com what the computer spits out in terms of the results is 1,000% determined by the question that we asked in the first place, by the variables that we use. So if racism 
for example, is not a variable in our analysis, it will never be part of the answer. And so again, going back to the questions we asked, the framing that we use, um, the answer is always determined by the question. And then I wanted to come back to um, the point that Anne made about language. And I do agree with Joe that everything matters, but um, Anne, you, you, you hit one of my triggers and, and that is language. And one of my biggest pet peeves, and sometimes we don't know what we don't know. And so we kind of pay attention to the most egregious form of language that can do a disservice to promoting diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging. But one that we commonly, that we still use at Berkeley and that universities use all over the place is diverse candidates, diverse applicants. What is a diverse candidate? What is a diverse applicant? Diverse means different. So a person can't be different from themselves. So diverse, even that term is a group level variable. It's not a variable that we can properly use at the individual level. But when we say diverse candidates or diverse applicants, what we're doing is othering them because the question then becomes different from what? It normalizes whiteness. And we have to really pay attention to the very basic language that we use that really does dog whistle underlying beliefs about, about, about ability and devaluation. Thank you. We're going to turn to audience questions, but before we do that, I want to throw my two words in since we're collecting words. Okay. Uh, mine is, my word is collegial. And the other one is, it's not a good fit. So I will turn it over to my co-moderator. Joanne Carney, uh, who will uh, regulate the flow of questions from the audience. Joanne is the uh, Chief Government Relations Officer at AAAS and a good friend. Thank you, Shirley. I wish we had a lot more time. Um, there have been a lot of kudos and wonderful uh, accolades from the audience and a, a number of great questions. Uh, the first one is uh, from an audience member that's kind of building off a, a point that Tashaka made about honest brokers. Um, they really like that idea, but they do express a, you know, a concern or a good concern about the dangers of overburdening black scientists uh, who are already overburdened. Um, and the danger of, um, of having to rely on them as this role uh, of being a mediator between scientists and the black community. So what are some ways that institutions can explicitly support these honest brokers as not to take advantage of or place even more burdens um, uh, on their already overburdened labors? And I opened it to others as well, but Tashaka, you wanted to take that? You know, that's a great point and a great question. It's something I've grappled with throughout my career. Um, often I've been the only black person in the room <laughs> of, of scientists that, and you talk about that lonely walk down the hall, Joseph. Um, I went you know, to majority white institutions. I went to Princeton and then Rockefeller. There are very few African-Americans at those institutions in my departments. So I would often be one of few. Um, and so it is a burden. It's a burden that is going to be on us because the fact that we are there, we have to share our cultural experience, but it can be exhausting. Um, just being African-American, even in the workplace, even in this moment that we're in as a country, explaining to your white colleagues why things are so painful for you, what's going on in the world around us, and who've never really perceived the racism the way that you have, that's systemic in our society. So I would say that institutions could really lend support to their minority faculty that they have recruited, right? Um, to help them be those honest brokers, and by support, I mean actual time off or time allocated to have some of these conversations and even compensation uh, due to that, because you would pay a consultant to do this right, in your organization. Why are you not going to pay your, your faculty member or bump up their compensation that is sharing their unique experiences and helping you navigate this in your institution? So I think we need to think of some different models for that and not overburden those minority faculty or minority employees, because it is not fair to them. Also, I would say that the, the non-minority faculty have to step up. And then by this, I mean, recognize it's not all on the minority faculty. It's like, you really have to be in partnership with them. And by honest broker, I'll give you a good example of what I mean by that. 
in my field of genomics, I'm often giving lectures and even I go out to communities, churches, mostly African-American, uh, historically African-American churches and talk about genetics and genomics. But I'll bring other folks with me and not all my friends are black. There'll be white people. I'll give you a good example is George Church, who's an eminent uh, scientist, uh, one of the pioneers in the field of genomics. I've been in churches with George Church talking about genomics. I'm the honest broker for the community. He may say the exact same thing, but then they come up to me after for validation, but the message gets through. So it's important. And having George Church with me there helps the message, do you see? So I think that honest brokering works for all communities. Great. Um, that kind of ties in with the next question, which you, you referred to kind of raising their salaries to help compensate them. But there are, are there other ways of compensating uh, financially or through other mechanisms to allow uh, underrepresented minorities in STEM fields to, um, to kind of uh, lead other you know, uh, DEI programs? I just, I just want to say, this is not answering your question directly, but we really have to challenge institutions and organizations, uh, industry, to start looking at parity. How do you reach parity? We need to hire more um, faculty of color, and um, that's imperative. And so our institutions of higher ed have to reflect the population. I mean, that was the, the challenge that is being put out there. So, so we have to put our heads together. There's a lot of groups right now, uh, given all of the things that have happened over the, the summer uh, that have really put a highlight on, on, these, um, on, on the lack of representation uh, and, and, and began to change what we're doing in K through 12, what we're doing in, uh, what we're doing in, at the university with our students and elevating them and, and really creating more, um, more allies and, and uh, an emphasis on reaching parity. Yeah, I, I think along those lines, um, you know, uh, friends of mine, uh, Deborah Rollison at uh, the Naval Research Labs and, and others have talked a lot about how Title IX, uh, you know, does it does just just does not refer to women and and uh, or just doesn't refer to athletics, you know, and, and you know, if you really want to, you know, you always chase the money if you want to make a difference and not much has changed in my career. And, you know, if you want to really spook an institution, you sort of ask them, you know, how Title IX are they compliant across the organization, uh, you know, because that it starts impacting research dollars. And so, you know, I think I think it's those kinds of you know big you know opportunities that you know if an institution realize you know not re they already realize it, but now you document it and you sort of recognize it that you cross the board you might need to be Title IX compliant to get research funding. You know, those are the kinds of things that can have you know huge impacts. And look, you know, I'm I'm getting older now, and you know, in my career. You know the, the 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 faculty have not reflected our communities, and despite all the talk, this whole time, you know, thirty years in academia, very little has changed, and so we've got it. We've got to do something different because it's not working. And maybe in the chaos of COVID and and uh, uh, you know all the all the brutality we're watching on TV and all these things is really the moment. You know, the the moment of the chaos. It's a time to really you know, move some things, agendas along that uh, just haven't moved in, in recent times. And Joanne, if I could just jump in and um, I just want to plus one what Anne and others have said in terms of the importance of increasing the number of underrepresented minority faculty in institutions of higher education um, for a number of reasons. Um, one, getting back to what Tashaka said, is this issue of honest brokers, but also coupling that with, with this idea, well, it's not an idea, it's real, um, the black tax, right? And what happens when you don't have a critical mass, um, whatever critical mass means. And we've had lots of discussions about what is that number? What is that magic number? But the reality of it is that those of us who look like this, 
despite all of the allies and other folks who are out there, the students of color come to our offices. They're crying in our offices. They're emptying our tissue boxes um, because of the experiences that they're having in their classrooms, in the kitchens, in the hallways, et cetera. And we have to be there to be that support system for them. And we want to, because we remember what it was like to shock a, you know, I was a biology major in neurophysiology at University of Maryland, 40,000 students. I was often the only one in a class of three or 400 students. Um, and so who do you go to to get the validation that you need, to feel like you belong, to get the support that you need? They come to us. And so when there are only a few of us, not only are we doing all the same things that our colleagues are doing, but we're also we are also providing that additional support that, again, we want to do because we want to make things better. But it is an additional job and responsibility that we don't get credit for. And often the students that the students that come to me, they're not all my students. I don't get credit for them. I don't get to put them on my dossier and say that these were my advisees, but they come to me anyway. And so there's that issue. But I also think in terms of the pipeline is that the more faculty that we have that represent our communities is gonna draw more students. And so it is going to inherently help address, I'm not gonna say that, that it is um, the only solution, but it will help address the pipeline issue of bringing more underrepresented students into the universities because they will see that they're that the faculty are representative of them and are likely asking the kinds of questions and involved in the kind of work that is of interest to those students. And so I think that you know growing the underrepresented faculty is huge and it requires an institutional commitment. And the last thing that I'll say is that someone, I can't take credit for this, someone said it and I thought it was so powerful that there is still unfortunately, and this is a big issue in California and Michigan and other places, there still is a lot of um, opposition to affirmative action. We have um, a proposition that's gonna go back on the ballot this year that really is um, trying to um, reverse Proposition 209. And there have been many um, such attempts since it's passing and it has not been successful. But then someone said to me, why are people so opposed to affirmative action for underrepresented minorities, given that white folks had affirmative action since history began. And we don't think of it like that. Affirmative action has actually been in place for whites for a really long time. And all we're trying to do is level the playing field. And without those kinds of state and national policies, then universities in some ways, even with the best intentions, hands are tied in terms of strategies for, um, for, for diversifying the professoriate. I, want, I wanted to jump in on that because first of all, Monty, you read my mind. Black tax was the word going through my mind <laughs> when we were talking earlier. And Joe, you bring up a good point um, about the academia not changing. Um, but there is a real black tax. And I, I credit a publication from AAAS from maybe about nine years ago, the Ginther Report, showing the actual tax of racism that black researchers experience when they go for R01 funding. That was amazing to me because it highlights the disparity, not just in academia, but throughout all sectors of science. This is a systemic issue, right? So what you've described in academia, I've also seen in government, which I've been at, um, as well as in industry, biotechnology and pharma. If you look at the highest echelons of these places, it is very lacking in diversity. It's been that way, it's a power thing. And I think that that's unfortunate because it shouldn't be about the power, it should be about the ability. Um, and that's what I think we need to really get to. Um, you know, discrimination was an enforced system, not necessarily a logical, right? It made sense for the people who were trying to enforce it, but it doesn't make sense overall because it, it means you're, you're not taking advantage of all of your talent out there. And I think that's what we have to get towards. Um, I think this, the whole of science has to look at this and maybe AAAS and as other organizations can really lead this discussion because we need to not only get the root cause, we've talked about that a lot. I've found that we do a good job of identifying the problem, but what I wanna try to get towards is, is actual solutions. And there are some basic things we can do, just like root out the racism. Let's look at where it is and let's like, I, like call it what it is and really you know, keep it real and try to go get it, right? And, and I think things like the Ginther Report start to put some numbers to it, uh, which I think is a good place to start like you know we can get, do better from here uh, but really you know keeping it real with ourselves all of us from all the communities to to really understand where the racism is and how to root it out because it doesn't help the overall enterprise of science it actually 
hurts us by not allowing us to take full advantage of all the talent out there. I want to give a shout out to AAAS really quickly around sea change. You know, this is the work of Shirley Malcolm. I mean, I think it's phenomenal and in, in the processes that put put together to really look at the data and to really start creating action plans around how you're going to change the numbers. And they had a, an initiative this summer where it was looking rather than at the institutional level, departmental level. So you, you could look at physics or computer science and different um, different uh, disciplines and then do that within that discipline if you're not don't have the support of, of the whole institution. And I think it's an excellent approach to start addressing this at the departmental level and then at the institutional level. I, I wanted to make one quick final little comment on that though, because that's a great point. And I think when you get to the higher levels and I just want to use a personal anecdote, I chose to not go into academia because of the racism I saw there at the highest levels. So when I thought about you know, the, the career path I wanted to have, did I want to keep banging my head against this racial glass ceiling or did I want to have some more freedom of movement that my educational background allowed me to have? I chose that, that latter. So I think, um, you know, these are going to really be important uh, factors in students' choices. Even once you train them to go through STEM degrees, how many of them stay with it through the end to their department chairs or running some of these organizations? If opportunity is not created for them, you're really building a pipeline to nowhere. So I'd like to we have about 20 different kinds of questions, which why I apologize, we are not going to get to all of them, but this has been an amazing conversation. Um, and the, some of the points and that, that this, and uh, Amani Tashaka that you've raised, um, I would like to encourage those uh, on the audience as well to, to listen to the remarks of our CEO Suda uh, Parikh this morning, because he touched upon uh, some of the uh, steps that AAAS has taken in terms of kind of uh, uh, making ourselves accountable and understanding where we are uh, when it comes to the issues of, of uh, STEM, uh, racism and STEM. Um, so we recognize that we need to understand ourselves before we can, uh, you know, decide what our path forward is. But kind of building on some of this kind of conversation about how, what the next question is about the concrete actions. Uh, you know, Anne, you touched a bit about sea change. That's an action that the scientific community can take, but what other actions should grant uh, making agencies and the universities themselves take to create uh, a better system of accountability, uh, whether it's through education resources or monitoring, uh, those types of things, but what other things uh, that, that they could do? Well, just a comment, you know, the new uh, proposal cycles uh, at NIH because of the absolutely horrific data uh, that was generated regarding bias in, in the grant process. You know, some of the, I, I just participated in my fir very first writing of a grant, you know, where we're, we're writing in a whole new genre now of writing, you know, where you're, you're not disclosing you know, uh, there's no links in the grant regarding to who you are, who your home institutions are, you know, and, and uh, it was, it was kind of refreshing in some ways to write a grant in a new way, you know, where it's, uh, it's in this anonymous kind of approach. It's going to be interesting to look at the data now that we get a few of these cycles going, you know, whether there are changes in this. Um, and, uh, but, you know, I think that's a really profound impact. And it's, it's changes fundamentally how you write and think about your science in, in some ways. And it, there was a refreshing level uh, about it, you know, in writing because it was very different and, and it, was, it was more data driven in some interesting ways. But I think that's a really profound one that's emerging. We'll see, we'll see how well it does. Uh, but, the, you know, we have to look at it post, the, post a couple of reward cycles. Mm -hmm. uh, piggybacking on that, um, two things came to mind. One, from a grants perspective, is really paying attention. And I think that grant making institutions can really um, play a large role in paying attention to what they are calling for, what kind of research they are calling for. Um, as someone who, for example, does work on racism and health, it's challenging for me to figure out which institute to send my grants to. Um, given, given the nature of the calls for proposals that are out there. So, you know, I, 
you know, the, the primary grant making institution for health research is NIH, but there are others um, out there as well. And I would argue that, you know, there's a large role that they can play in, in, in agenda setting for research by what they put in their calls for proposals. So that's one point. The other point that I want to make is to draw a corollary between what you were saying, Joe, around um, around kind of the blinded nature of the proposal writing to some efforts that we're taking in the School of Public Health at Berkeley to better blind the application process when we are searching for new faculty FTEs. And we have for a long time included um, processes like having our faculty equity advisor involved in all search committees to ensure that, that uh, best practices for DEI are taken into account. But what we're having a conversation specifically about right now is the blinding of the application so that you don't see the applicant's name, the institution where they got their um, doctorate, because often insta um, degree granting institution as you, is used as a proxy for excellence and is attributed to the individual when that not, might not be the case. And then we also know that that has embedded within it all kinds of issues around race, racism, and access to educational institutions. Um, and then also blinding the letters of reference so that you can't tell where the referees are coming from because once again, that whole issue of institutional proxy or mentor proxy is being used. And I saw one study that showed that I don't have the numbers right off the top of my head, but that showed that for a um, a vast majority of um, applications that came in and people that were hired that only a small handful of them um, were kind of broadly representative of the educational universe out there. The vast majority came from maybe seven institutions or something like that. Um, and so it really does show the power of some of these kind of institutional practices that we can institute to try to better diversify our, our faculty. I would, I would just applaud your comments, Amani. The, you know, the you know, breaking um, the trajectory or breaking the uh, the privilege, you know, that is happening uh, in in the process. There's got to be ways of doing this because it it is uh, there's momentum at these institutions for perpetuating what was, and uh, and if you don't institute those, you know, you're never going to break the cycle. And so I applaud you on that and I applaud NIH and other places that are beginning to do that, but it's gonna take some time and one's gotta look at the data and be really rigorous in, in looking at the impact that it's doing because it's how you, blind, how you write how you, uh, and do that is a whole new, you know, a whole new uh, uh, art in what you write now and it's gonna be different and we gotta help train people on how to do that properly. I'd like to add really quickly that NSF has funded um, HSIs, tribal colleges, and HBCUs to come together to give recommendations on how they can how they can do better, and also to start building capacity at these institutions. So, uh, I applaud them for doing that, and thanks both of you for your comments. I really appreciate it. Okay, so this will have to be, we only have a couple of minutes left, so I'm going to kind of transition for this one last question. Since uh, issues of implicit bias about what grant-making institutions can um, can do, I'd like to ask all the speakers to kind of, what do you see as the, the, the possible impacts of the recent executive order restricting not only federal agencies' ability to, to conduct training on DEI-related matters that issue address issues like implicit bias, but also the fact that federal agencies um, will are supposed to be reviewing grants, the grant grant proposals and the grant making procedures. Um, what do you see as kind of the potential downside? Oh, well, um, predict, I don't know if you could predict, but uh, I don't know if you're already seeing consequences of uh, the impacts of this at your own institutions, but please uh, respond in terms of what you see as the, the consequences of this. I, I, and I, I'll go first here because I, I, I'm so frightened by that. <laughs> I, I've worked in the government and I know the work that needs to be done here all around. And to see that kind of um, executive order come out is very terrifying, quite frankly, because I think it just tries to undo even the bit of progress that was being made. Um, and if anything, you need to be doubling down in the other direction, as we've talked about in this uh, session, is you know implicit bias is there. It's affecting decisions and it is impacting people's lives here. 
And so if we, we need more training and sensitivity, not less. Um, and so I think that that, that whole uh, effort needs to be undone. I hope it doesn't stand. Um, and I'm hoping to see some change with that in the, in the coming uh, months here because it, it would really be bad for that to, to be established policy. Uh, plus, saying- one, plus one on everything Tashika said, Tashaka said, and uh, just everyone's got to vote. 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 So we have seen, we have seen um, a lot of emails coming uh, in the, to the upper administration asking about, you know, it, it's, been, it's been effective at scaring people. And, but our message is that we have to, con- we're, we're going to continue. I mean, we have to continue with, our, uh, with all of our, uh, the approaches that we're using for DEI and um, talking about implicit bias. I mean, we have to just keep on going and we have to do it in an equitable manner. I'll just um, I'll just plus one what everyone said. I completely agree, and I and I would just add that I think that there is an important role that institutions can play, medical institutions, institutions of higher education, and many other types of institutions um, in banding together and really um, creating a collective voice in opposition to that. Um, I agree with you, Tashaka, a hundred percent that it is very scary and. Um, and we're, we're, we're in for huge disappointment if that stands. Uh, and I will just note to, to you all and to the audience that Triple A did join in a, a, a letter uh, that uh, along with 50 other organizations requesting that LMB, that the White House rescind uh, the executive order. Uh, so uh, we, we hear you all and agree. Um, I'll just now in closing, turn this back to my amazing uh, co-moderator, Shirley Malcolm. Okay. Um, I just want to thank everyone for attending. We really appreciate it. And uh, to, uh, in the words of John Lewis, uh, I would just urge us all to go out there and get in good trouble. (laughs) We may want to keep our heads down for a while, but otherwise, we have to move forward uh, in order to make sure that the steps toward a better future are those that are inclusive, are equitable, are fair, and are just. Thank you very much. <laughs>